Thank you. He's good behind. Behind the line. Sorry, can you go behind? Just stay behind the banner, please. We are going to let you all not not wait hold on not everybody not everybody Sorry. <laughs> well, Brian, I thought you went back to the mine. I thought it was clear. <laughs> When we establish ourselves in Lesotho and were able to set up the underground and military units inside the country and began to operate, South Africa became nervous. They decided to eliminate me in 1981 by sending an agent to plant a bomb under my car. That uh, attempt was abortive. Then they made uh, two other attempts to get me killed. In 81, they Rather than 82 or 81, I'm not sure. They sent units of the SATF to go and kill as many of our people inside the suit, including refugees. Because their intelligence was faulty, they thought that I was in the country. They tried to attack the flat where I used to stay. But uh, just a, f a flat away from my own, they attacked, convinced that uh, I was in that flat and killed the locals. So this was a measure of desperation. It was not only in Lesotho, they went across Mozambique and killed refugees and a few of our comrades, they went into Botswana. They were crazy. They, 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 they decided that uh, they were going to take off their gloves and that they were going to kill anybody who harbored us, who, 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 who was unfortunate to stay next to us, whether it was, he was a Musotu, a Mutswana, a Zimbabwean. That was the nature of the frenzy existing in Pretoria. It makes me actually uh, realize, you see, with impatience, the need to, to, to defeat you know, this, this, this regime. And uh, I don't mince my words when I'm speaking about this regime. I hate it intensely. I hate it. Every time I stand on a platform, I'm reminded of these gruesome atrocities. I'm even reminded of my own children. If they had succeeded, they would have killed. My children were, you know, at that time, one of them was two years old, another one 10 years, a baby. And I saw it as a basically an inhuman regime, a cruel regime. And people who were fighting for a right to oppress the majority of the people of this country. And I, I, I disagree with a lot of people who think that Dick Clegg and others have changed. Because Dick Clegg and others have done nothing about uh, you know, removing the forces that they created. You know, it's not just Hammer, Van der Vestes, and Geld, Hugo, or whatever, whatever his name. It is those people who strategized and, pro and worked out the strategies and tactics of destroying us. Dick Clegg, Rolf Meyer, Adrian Flock, Magnus Malan. Big Porter, who are, were in the center of the strategy of uh, killing people, you know, in the State Security Council. And therefore, we 
That's why some of us have got reservation about the amnesty they are talking about. Before you consider an amnesty, let us see what they did. They, when we were coming back, they wanted us. They, they, they forced us to fill forms to say what did we do, and I think that should apply to them as well. For most of us, this was uh, the realization of our dreams as uh, young combatants. We had been given very, very, you know, thorough training in the Soviet Union, and we had undergone a lot of physical and military preparations in Zambia because we established a special camp in Zambia to to prepare ourselves both physically, mentally, and militarily. We had exercises day and night. We embarked on long marches. So we were we had prepared thoroughly for this thing. So when we crossed the Zambezi, for us this was the real thing. For the first time, we're going to get involved with the real enemy. <laughs> In our camps, we had you know, been shooting at targets. You know, you know, paper targets. Now we're going to get involved to see, pitting our strength, testing ourselves against the other side. And uh, we, we were, we were quite happy. Uh, I was very, very happy as, as a person. I think I was, I was among the first to cross the Zambezi River in a canoe. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we decided to choose the most difficult and impossible part of the river where there were gorges. And we're doing this at night, it was dark, but we made it, you see, because we're, we're, we're fit, actually. We're, we're, we're really specimens of uh, physical fitness. We're carrying our weapons, you see, AK-47, machine guns, grenades, um, lots of ammunition. And uh, the, 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 those rucksacks were heavy, but we didn't feel it. We, 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 and, uh, it was one of uh, those memora memorable days in, the, in my own history. I, I look back to that situation with, uh, with uh, vivid memories. Uh, whenever I, when I was in Zambia, whenever I crossed, you know, visiting Zimbabwe before I came back into the country, I would make a point to, to drive uh, through Livingstone, Victoria Falls, stop next to the Wanke Game Reserve, and just have a look at that general terrain, you see, because one thing I can say, it took the Zimbabwean uh, security forces a long time before they, they knew of our presence inside Zimbabwe. In terms of uh, our ability to, to orientate ourselves on the terrain, we had no problems because we had uh, accumulated a lot of knowledge of uh, topography and map reading. We were able to, to detect from our maps and to place ourselves. We knew exactly where we were. We had a, a clear picture about uh, the next, you know, part of the terrain in, in which we're going to move. And uh, one thing outstanding about that unit was its ability to take positions during the day, especially when uh, the, the cover, you know, the, in terms of vegetation became sparse and poorer, and uh, moving at night. We were able to use uh, our knowledge of stars to, to, to guide us in terms of uh, the, the direction of our movements. And uh, in a way, because we studied these maps before we crossed the river, uh, we had no problems. And deliberately, we had decided to avoid physical contact with the people until, you see, we had established ourselves inside Zerodesia. Because we were quite aware that, you know, early contact with the people would lead to a situation where some of them might inform the other side. We're aware of uh, the reputation of the Rhodesian security forces in terms of, uh, you know, setting up a network of agents in the in the rural areas and in the villages. So I would think that you see, for the first few weeks, everything moved according to plan. It ticked uh, very very well, and there were no surprises, except that uh, what worried us was uh, that uh, two or three comrades lost their way at night. We could not establish contact with them. And that worried us because uh, we, we had a fear, a premonition that uh, they, they might fall into the hands of the enemy and therefore disclose uh, prematurely the presence of the detachments in, in Rhodesia. 
And that turned out to be the truth. These photo plays would start at, uh, I mean, very early in the morning at six o'clock. Uh, this, was, this was in winter. And I think about 11 or 10, uh, the, a report came that uh, there was a, a movement of trucks. We had already passed now the, the Wanky Game Reserve. Uh, and then, of course, we had two, two positions. We saw these trucks carrying soldiers and uh, some of the trucks, you know, pulling, you know, water, water cases. And it was quite clear that this was a, a detachment of uh, the Rhodesian army uh, deployed against us in the field day and night. But for some reason, although they passed probably 100 meters from us, they pass on. But uh, after they had passed, I would say four hours or five hours, they must have detected our general position. Um, because uh, earlier on, there had been a change of fire. And after that temporary exchange of fire, we noticed that uh, two of our comrades were missing. They'd gone to look for water. Uh, those two comrades were Ernest Mudulo and uh, one comrade called Mampuru from the Northern Transvaal, from Skukuneland. Uh, and uh, their disappearance now confirmed our fears that uh, the, that exchange of fire must have involved them. Um, and that necessitated, uh, you know, urgent preparations on our part to prepare for battle. Mm. Then uh, all of a sudden, I think at about 15 hours, there was uh, a rapid fire towards our direction, a bit wild, with uh, frequent shouts calling upon us to surrender. And uh, the call to surrender was followed by shouts that uh, we were surrounded, it was useless to fight, terrorists surrender. Now, those of us who were in command now said, uh, look, chefs, nobody is allowed to pull the trigger before the target is properly identified and seen. There must be a clear economy of ammunition. We don't know how these battles are going to, to last. We have no supplies. So every bullet is precious. So there must be no panicky firing back. Now they continued firing and uh, clearly worried about our silence. There was deafening silence, a lot of tension. You must remember this was the first experience of a battle. None of us had ever been fired at and I can tell you it was frightening because these bullets were passing very close to us over our heads and uh, I remember some comrades actually panicked and uh, there was one who, who came to, uh, to say to us that he was wounded and we discovered that he was not wounded he was just panicking uh, but the, the arrogant enemy stood up to say uh, one of them said uh, where are they can you see them they had thrown caution to the wind, and I suppose they thought that we were scared. And our comrades said, uh, he said in, actually in Zulu, closer, Nahanguya. And man, our fellows just opened almost at the same time and they shot two of them. And uh, fortunately, the, 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 the guys they shot were the commanders. And you see, a regular army, unlike a guerrilla army, depends on a commander. The commander is the key person. When the commander is... Uh, you know, killed or wounded and is unable to command. You see, the morale of the regular army is affected. So there was a lot of panic on their part and they began to run away. Then we, we began now to chase them and, uh, to, and to really, you know, dispel the attack. We neutralized the attack. And we discovered, you see, for the first time that, uh, look, we are dealing with people who are also very afraid. Because in running away, they left behind their weapons, their supplies of ammunition, food and everything. I mean, that is sort of a, 
and he has very undisciplined way of retreating. You see, you, you don't retreat and leave behind your guns, you see, because how are you going to fight again? Mm. So they ran away in a very disorderly manner. And that was our first baptism of fire. We're baptized now. Mm. We're stronger. We had, uh, the fear was gone. You know, the nervousness, you know, the, the throbbing of the heart against the ribs it disappeared. You see, we're all unnerved now. We're very cool and determined. But again, we had not been eating well for a very long time. So this was a welcome supply of food for us. The masses on the ground had not been organized to receive us and to give us the necessary support in terms of intelligence, in terms of protecting us, in terms of giving us regular meals, and in terms of guiding us generally within Rhodesia itself. It was clear that we had a responsibility to save the detachment. It would have been wrong militarily to fight to the last man. We had beaten back the Rhodesian forces a number of times. We never lost a battle. And every time we beat them back, but we also suffered a few casualties, probably six to seven comrades who died there. And uh, after thorough examination of uh, what suddenly shocked us, the openness of the terrain as you move towards Plum Tree, towards the Matabele land, with uh, no trees except some traps and no mountains, we, we felt that now we're beginning to be a sitting dark in terms of the enemy's planes. The planes of the enemy had bombed us twice. I mean, the, jet, the jets and the helicopters. And that uh, sort of uh, compelled us to take a decision to retreat to Botswana in order to, to build up our forces, to, uh, re to reestablish, as well as to reestablish contact with headquarters in Osaka. That we, we did, I mean, in terms of retreating to Botswana. But unknown to us, Botswana, South Africa, and Zimbabwe had been, you know, pulled into the question of uh, looking for us. Of course, probably with different motives. Uh, Rhodesia and South Africa definitely to, 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 to search and destroy. Botswana to identify us and arrest us and uh, negotiate with the ANC about our presence. So when we went to Botswana, after a few days, you see, we were discovered. Uh, there was a, a difference amongst us as to whether we should resist arrest and fight back. Uh, there was a strong feeling that, you know, we should not allow these fellows to capture us. But there was also a strong feeling that, look, Botswana is an independent African state, a member of the OAU, and that uh, fighting them would create problems for the ANC mission to never be understood by our people if... Uh, we had a situation where Botswana soldiers were, were killed in action against us. So ultimately, we agreed that uh, let us surrender. After we had been assured by the Botswana officers that uh, they were under pressure from South Africa and that we wouldn't be imprisoned, we, we would just you know, be allowed to would be sent back to, to Zambia. So after some time, then we, we surrendered. But they never kept their word. I think they were under pressure from South Africa. They were afraid. I mean, clearly the government was afraid. They had a small army, small police force, which could never stand up to the, to the bullies in Pretoria. So the price they had to pay was actually to imprison us. We were sentenced uh, to long terms of imprisonment, four years, five years, six years, and, and we served sentences in the, the Khabarone maximum uh, security jail. I was a, a militant and angry young man. I wanted to go back and fight after resting, after resting for a few months. I found our movement totally unprepared for the continuation of the armed struggle in South Africa. That was my reading of the situation. Of course, there were reasons that they were put forward. I found a lot of preoccupation with solidarity work, with international work. And I found a lot of uh, demoralization amongst uh, our chaps who were in camps in, in, in Zambia. And I began to agitate for the resumption of the armed struggle, for seriousness on the part of the leadership. I'm using the word seriousness because in my own view, and this was a subjective point of view, that they were not serious. 
And I, I became part of the writing of a memorandum which was very critical of the leadership. Well, that memorandum put us into uh, some trouble. The leadership was angry. They thought our attacks were unfounded and irrational. And some of them felt that our attacks uh, bordered on insubordination and on mutiny. Uh, we were suspended from the organization. But that memorandum brought about a lot of heated discussion within the ANC, the need to have a conference, the need to work out a clearer strategy of struggle, of revolutionary struggle. And uh, ironically, there was the Morogoro Conference. We were excluded from the Morogoro Conference because we were regarded as rebels. But I'm happy to say that Morogoro Conference ushered in serious discussions which led to the, for the first time, to the formulation of a clear strategy about the waging of a revolutionary war in the country, of a people's war, the need to build the underground, the need for propaganda, the need uh, for mass mobilization. So despite the fact that, I mean, I, I, I sort of uh, suffered as a co-author of the document in terms of isolation, in terms of uh, suspension, but I felt uh, that uh, I, was, I was going to, to accept any sort of punishment because I told the people, though some of them thought that I was a traitor, that, you know, my, my basic objective is struggle in South Africa. You know, I could have left, you see, as others did, and uh, to go and study. I, I had a degree from Rhodes University. Uh, but I felt that I was not going to go and study. It was uh, my revolutionary duty to be part of uh, the the, the armed struggle of the revolution in South Africa. So I was able to see, to understand, you know, the, the anger and the bitterness of others. And, uh, but I felt that, you see, whatever they said, I, I was not a traitor. I had no malicious intentions in writing that document. That document was a product of my own subjective feelings about the need to intensify the battles inside South Africa. And I'm happy that, you see, we remained and they continue to be part of preparations for the continuation of the political and military struggle inside our country. I want to be honest, I was annoyed. I was marooned in the trans guy when the decision was taken to suspend the arms struggle. My indemnity had been withdrawn. I spent more than 27 years in MK. I'd spent the best part of my life in an arms struggle against this regime. I was angry and bitter that this decision was taken without comprehensive consultation. That was my immediate gut feeling. I didn't sleep when uh, our delegation was locked with the clerk negotiating. I was waiting for the outcome. When there was that press conference early in the morning announcing the suspension of military activities, I felt like crying. I'm one of the people who have seen comrades dying, both inside the country and outside the country, in the struggle against the regime of terror in Pretoria. I know the names, I know the faces. I know how these young people put aside everything in life to concentrate in the fight against white domination. And I said to myself, probably this, this was the right decision, but why was it that there was no widespread consultation with those who were actually involved in the physical side of armed struggle. That was my initial reaction. But like a disciplined soldier, a disciplined member of the movement, the decision had been taken. I had to understand this decision. And when it was explained that it was important to maintain the momentum of negotiations, I was ready to, to, to be reined in to explain it to other comrades. And I did it. Because in a movement as big as ours, Sometimes I've got to subject your own strong personal views and accept the views of the majority in the leadership.
there's a certain there's a certain form of attachment that South Africans have for this country. I'm speaking about those with whom we shared uh, times in exile. I'm speaking about the excitement I sensed in MK Kedas coming back into the country even before I came back legally. How they felt good about going back to South Africa, though they were going back to fight. That's the sort of love and patriotic fervor that we had. When I was coming back, I was saying that uh, for me this is a moment of, uh, of happiness, of joy, sheer joy. To listen to our people speaking their own languages, to be able to read South African newspapers, to be able just to sit and watch our people. The, you know, the beautiful people of South Africa who we have been subjected to a cruelty no other people, what very few people in the world have seen, but the brave, proud black South Africans who with their hands with limited resources have refused to be to be proud to be proud beaten, have refused to surrender. For although I was not coming into a situation of freedom, but I knew that uh, nothing would stop us from marching forward to freedom to a new South Africa, into a free country, into a country where they would fight for social justice, in a country where we would begin to tackle the problems of the the poverty of our people. And for me, therefore. This was uh, not marching back home, but marching along the path of struggle to a liberated country.